Welcome to Invisible Church, the uh, video uh, Bible study podcast of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Newell, Minnesota. I'm Pastor Tim Smith. We're continuing with Solomon's Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. Last time in our introduction, we talked about different ways of uh, interpreting the book of the authorship we take to be Solomon. Uh, we're taking the book in two different ways, both as a parable about uh, how uh, the love in a marriage can also apply to God's love for his church. And we're applying the song in both ways, both within a marriage, how can I learn from the song about my marriage, and how can I learn from the song also about my relationship with Christ. Um, this is, uh, I think, the best way to take the song, the song as we uh, remember that the, 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 the intimacy of a couple is like the intimacy of God and his people, and that God wants us uh, to realize that his love for us is an actual love, um, a real love. So we got as far as verse 2 of chapter 1, and we're going to continue then with verse 3, remembering that the woman... Um, is speaking. She is the most common speaker, I believe, throughout the song, and she is uh, talking about her fella, talking about her man. Verse 3. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. Um, perfume poured out here. Uh, your name is like perfume poured out. The Hebrew is really oil of turuk, um, which uh, seems to be a place name, and we do the same thing sometimes with different perfumes or or things. Uh, Cologne, for example, is a city uh, and a place name, and 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 so perfume from that city becomes Cologne, um, and so your name is like Cologne. Uh, might be a, a better way of translating here. We're following the uh, we're actually following the old um, 1978 NIV. Um, as we're uh, following along the oldest copy, uh, complete copy of the of the Bible um, in the NIV version, um, the ideal of of uh, of, of this uh, the name is when, when when she says she delights so much in 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 her guy's name is this is a reminder of everything he means to her and spiritually. That is also what happens. Everything God is, everything God does, everything God has done is there in his name. And we use God's name uh, according to the commandment to pray, praise, and give thanks. And we also see that there is a relationship in marriage. Um, we, can, we can make an application here between the eighth and the second commandments that just as in the second commandment, we don't want to to uh, ever say anything against God, but only praise him as we talk about God. So also in the Eighth Commandment, especially with your spouse, you never want to talk badly about your spouse when your spouse is there or when your spouse isn't there or even in your thoughts. When you talk about your spouse, you should sound like God the Father talking about his son at the baptism of Jesus or at the transfiguration where God the Father, who all along in the Old Testament was saying, listen to me, don't listen to any other gods. And then what happens? Up comes Jesus out of the river and God the Father says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And, and people should be shocked that, that God the Father says that about Christ, but he does. That, that's the spectacular event in the baptism of Christ and in the transfiguration is the Father telling us, you've been listening to me all along, now listen to him. And then when Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, he says the same thing about the Spirit. Wait for the Spirit whom I and the Father will send to you. Um, so the, 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 the persons of the Trinity constantly talk up about one another and that's what we should always do with our spouse is is when uh people around us are talking about their relationships and we should say oh do you know what my spouse has done for for example i've said this more than once but my wife taught me 
uh, uh, how to be a better Christian by her regular habit of getting her church envelope and the envelopes for our kids, all of our envelopes ready, not just on Saturday night and laying them on the table, but actually uh, when it came to, to the offering she and I gave, she would at the beginning of the month write out the checks of what we are going to, we are planning to give every Sunday all month. She would write those checks out at the beginning of the month and 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 have them there on hand so that when Saturday night came and we're putting the coins in the boys' envelopes and teaching them how to put money in their envelopes and lick the envelopes and have them ready for church or Sunday school or both. And then our envelope would be there too. Easy peasy. There's nothing to it. It's already been taken care of. Uh, right away, the first thing that Kath always did was let's get our offering ready. We give off the top to God. Um, and and when when any of us talks about our spouse, we should remember to do that, to, 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 to put our spouse first. And so that when we do talk about our spouse, we can do it in a loving way that, that, that shows what they do, that we learn from, that we love about them, that we love so dearly. Your name is like perfume poured out. And then no wonder the maidens love you. Well, the maidens here, or the virgins, Alma or Almoth, is, uh, is, is the Hebrew. No wonder they love you. And notice there's no jealousy there. She is happy with who her guy is, and she doesn't blame uh, the other girls for, 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 for having a crush on her guy. Um, as long as the sixth commandment and the tenth commandment are obeyed, you know, nobody's going to commit adultery with my guy. Nobody's going to covet him. Yeah, but I understand why they kind of, they watch him go by and they all go, ah, oh, because, because she thinks he's the best guy on earth. And she says, yeah, I, I, I see why other girls would think the same thing of my guy. And there's no jealousy there at all. But as, and so for her, the husband she's been given by God is, is who? He's her Prince Charming. He is the man. When, when she thinks about love and marriage, all she has to do is think about her own husband and she doesn't have to go anywhere else with that because that's what God wants us to think about our marriage. No matter who our marriage is to, um, this is the one God has given to me. And, and then with regard to a spiritual application, um, it's a little bit easier here because the other members of the church, the other maidens, the other virgins, of course, they're going to love Christ as well as we do. We don't mind sharing our Savior with everybody else who puts their faith in him, with everybody else who prays to him, with everybody else who adores him and reveres him as God and, 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 and worships him as God, the risen Savior. We understand that. No wonder everybody else loves you, Lord. I do too. So, verse 4. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. Okay, here's the here's the prince charming part. She 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 sees him as as the ideal, and it's as if really as if the song here. We're only in verse four. It's like they're beginning with the honeymoon at the beginning of the of the of the passage, and they just want to be together. They want to spend time together all the time. When they're apart, when she's at work, when he's at work, they think about each other. And when they're at home, they think about getting away together. That's what they do. And a spiritual application here of the, this beginning part of verse 4 is we want to yearn and spend time alone in, with, with God in study of his word. It's our daily time with him and his reminders of, of his love for us. And so, sure, we just want to be with God and to, to love him uh, more dearly, to follow him more nearly, to love him, uh, to see him more clearly day by day. The, verse 4 um, has a, a second half, and here we have a different people speaking because they say we, and we don't know if this is the girls, although they just got mentioned at the beginning of verse 4, so I think it's the, the virgin girls, the bridesmaids, um, uh, but it's the chorus, and they say we rejoice and delight in you, we will praise your love more than wine. How right they are to adore you. Um, and so once again, the, 
the hint here is that it's not a typical uh, marriage. Um, although, you know, as they as they re as they rejoice and pray the lovemaking of the couple or the or the caresses of the couple or what have you, um, we do remember that in certain uh, in ancient times in certain royal weddings, um, there was. Uh, there were witnesses for the wedding night consummation. That was a, a strange part of some ancient marriages in the Middle Ages and in the Dark Ages, but it did happen from time to time. But we, um, more importantly is the last line here, how right they are to adore you. Uh, the word there, um, uh, which I think is misharim, um, has this idea of, of being right and the translation or the interpretation of that word has given translators fits over the years and commentators too, because how right uh, is a way like an, like an exclamation, or is it simply the upright are the ones who adore you? The righteous are the ones who adore you. Uh, just a declarative statement. Um, uh, a Jewish interpretation is that Misharim is actually a, a, a variety of wine. Um, that this is the good wine. Um, uh, although the good wine adores you is a is a is a strange statement, but this uh, do are, do only the, the uh, uh, strictly speaking do only believers um, are are only believers the ones who can actually adore God properly, um, and uh, um, well uh, uh, back to the earlier part of the verse. Can I get back to that? Yeah, take me away, draw me away with you. Um, uh, Gregory, um, uh, a, a medieval commentator on this, he said that every act of Christ draws us to himself. It, it's instruction for us. It's, and he said, indeed, a stimulant. Um, God's words and works compel our words and works and, and even our thoughts. God is the one who draws us to him. Okay. Verse 5. Dark am I, yet lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Um, this is a, a, a verse that has had a lot of attention over the centuries, is also a verse that turns up in Star Trek, um, uh, although that's not our point here, but um, the, the dark skin is probably uh, lamented by the girl because she's she has to be a poor working girl out in the fields and she's sunburned. That seems to be the context of the verse that follows anyway. Um, and uh, uh, in their culture, uh, a, a lighter skin tone would be seen as uh, a mark of wealth, a life of leisure. This is a woman who doesn't have to be out in the sun. She can be at home and she can be pampered, taken care of, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, here, the woman is addressing the daughters of Jerusalem. Are they getting catty with her? That's Dr. Brooks' comment. Uh, she fears being taunted by, by other women because she isn't um, what they imagine uh, her husband would desire. She has to go out and work in the field, and doesn't her husband deserve better? And you're, you're not what your husband really wants, and she's worried about what other women think of her. Um, because she is dark like these tents, like the tent curtains of Solomon's tents. Uh, anything canvas, ship sails, uh, they darken with use. That was also true of the canvas drop cloths we used to use back in my house painting days. Um, a, you could always tell a brand new canvas because it's almost white, but uh, it doesn't take much sunlight. Uh, for it to darken up. And usually by the end of its first summer, it'll be pretty dark and dark brown within a couple of years of use. And the same is true of tents and of ship sails. Um, uh, in the days of, of sailing ships, the, the older sails would be dark brown and the newer sail would be almost white um, from disuse. And she is saying that uh, she is darkened like, a, like an old tent flap. Um, and she continues, do not stare at me. This is verse six. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I have neglected. So she's um, lamenting the fact that her brothers 
or her mother's sons, there might be a difference there, um, were uh, did something to her. They, they, they're the ones who forced her out to do work. And the brothers here play a kind of a mysterious role. They, they are my mother's sons, um, but there are two ways of looking at that. They could be her blood brothers, or they could be her stepbrothers. If her, her mother has married more than once, um, or a father has married more than once, and and there are these other sons in the in the marriage, or it could be her own brothers. But spiritually, saying my mother's sons is a reminder that what the Bible says, man born of woman, is is sinful. Um, other people in in the world, even the closest people to us, can lead us astray and lead us into sin, or lead us. Um, uh, to neglecting our faith. Um, you know, why do you have to be going to church every week? Isn't an hour a month enough? Why does it have to be an hour a week? Or how come you're going to Bible classes all the time? And, and, uh, uh, we, we, we get led into, 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 into being almost jealous of, 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 of somebody's time away from home. And, uh, this can, this can happen in any household. It doesn't matter. Um, how spiritual the household is. Um, uh, my wife, Kath, sometimes went to five different Bible classes during the week. And there were evenings where she would go to a, a Bible class with a couple of friends just up the street, just a couple of blocks away. And there were times when I just missed her because she's off, you know, studying God's word. But then again, I'm gone all day studying God's word. And shouldn't she get to have her time? Um, away too, and there wasn't jealousy, but there was that once in a while that the, the sinful flesh gets a hold of you, and says, uh, you know, I, I wish she was here, but I, and then, but then you turn around right away. I, although I'm glad she's doing what she's doing, but here, uh, the vineyard is something that's going to come up later in the book when she talks about her own vineyard. What's she talking about? Well, she's talking really about her body. That's her vineyard when she wants her husband to come into her vineyard. She's talking about, you know, let's, let's, let's be intimate. Let's make love in my own vineyard, my own body. I've neglected because I've been taking care of everything else that's going around. And it's not that the vineyards are, are identical in the, in the passage as if she's having to take care of other people's bodies, but rather um, she's out doing work and she's not at home taking care of herself. And so, um, in a in a in a marital state uh, or application, she is uh, looking after the family's needs more than her own personal needs, private needs, and spiritually, um, her vineyard is our life of faith, and our life of faith can darken with neglect. If we're off busy doing other things, uh, we can lose sight of what of what we need in our spiritual life as well. And we should remember that. Uh, for example, um, uh, let's say that there's somebody who's a Sunday school teacher, constantly taking care of the spiritual needs of little children. And week after week, and they adore it. They love it. They, they, they love being a Sunday school teacher. But they need to take care of their own spiritual needs as well, and, and not just spend all of their time on applying Bible stories to little children because they need to be able to apply the Bible to their own lives as well. And that's often on a different level. Um, children don't apply things intellectually in the same way that adults do. This is why we don't teach catechism to first and second graders because they're not ready for it. They have to learn the Bible stories first. Then they can apply the Bible stories um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the deeper way we do in confirmation class in the catechism. And so she's been taking care of others and she's been neglecting herself. All right, verse seven. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday, why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? Well, this, this is a question uh, that the woman is asking, really, where do you take your sheep during the day? And the question is, why doesn't she know this? Um, she she wants to get away with him. She even and, and she kind of says, you know, even midday would be okay. Although midday, the time of the siesta in in many uh, European cultures, 
um, and in the Middle East as well, that would be a pretty good time to to spend time in a in a tryst when he's kind of off duty and the and he's expected to to be resting at that time. Um, well, uh, a marital application here is that we don't always pay attention to each other. The the woman here should know where her guy is, but she doesn't really know, and. Uh, the spiritual connection is that we don't always seek God where he would be easily found. There are people who want to seek God in 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 a secular poem or, or, or out in the wilderness in the creation or to see God in flowers. And, you know, God tells us about himself in his in the text of his holy word. He teaches us about himself and what he's done for us and how much he loves us and we don't have to go looking for that in strange foreign places. He's given us his message. Well, in verse 8, we now switch from, oh, uh, one more thing about verse 7. Um, why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? Um, that That gives us the impression that she knows that if she gets by strange flocks or flocks of the friends, she shouldn't be there. There's something wrong with her being there. And she is off limits to them, of course. She's, she's veiled. She wants to be with her fella. Um, but is there something disreputable publicly about her showing up where her husband works? Um, does this remind us of that scene in the book of Ruth when, when Ruth goes to see Boaz and it's late at night and he's been drinking and she lays down at his feet and she uncovers his feet and what's going on there and he wakes up and he realizes this is a proposal of marriage um, and which to our culture that we're thinking this is a proposal of marriage but it was to them this is the equivalent of somebody getting down on one knee with a ring and and uh it, it surprises everybody in, in 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 the account it surprises boaz and ruth is you know, she wants to do this, but when Naomi suggests it, Ruth is even surprised by it. And so is there something that they have to be careful about when they're going to have this rendezvous? Well, verse 8. Um, oh, yeah, that we're, we're now, we think here that the, that the man is speaking or maybe the friends are speaking to her. Uh, whichever it is, uh, could be either one. And it's maybe not that important, but it's that it's being spoken to the woman is the important part. If you do not know most beautiful of women, that is where to find your guy. That's the context. Follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. Uh, so th th this answer almost seems to be a, a rebuke. Well, if you don't know, I, I don't know how to tell you to find me. Follow the Follow the sheep footprints. Follow the tracks of the sheep. And then... Graze your young goats. She, is she suddenly a shepherdess with her own goats? Although, um, you know, in a, in a in a parable, in an analogy, you don't always have to assign meaning to every single item. There doesn't always have to be meaning there. So, if she's a shepherdess or not, we don't have. She's really looking in a vineyard earlier. We don't have to uh, necessarily say there's a contradiction here. But there's stress in their relationship. There's tension. She wants to be with him. But something prevents her both and there and that that has both a marital and a spiritual um application we sometimes have to spend time apart and sometimes we end up spending time apart from god because something comes up in in our marriage or because we're taking care of our children or because there's a virus and we're bound at, at, at home but uh, from from going and doing things you would otherwise normally do now we're back to the man in verse 9, and he says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. Well, in ancient times, they didn't use uh, mares for work in uh, pulling chariots or in a war in the cavalry. They used stallions, and you can see this in the in the inscriptions. Uh, they were When we studied Habakkuk together, there were pictures from the era that clearly were stallions pulling their chariots and a mare in the harness along with the other three horses if one of them were a mare that would be a distraction not only to the opposing army but probably to the to the to the other horses and 
and uh, in a in a kind way, he's saying, "You are, you are a delightful distraction. You, you are, uh, uh, you're amazing. Uh, and and in fact, you'd be a distraction in the court of Pharaoh, even in the in the harness of Pharaoh. And you know, different cultures have different way of different ways of complimenting." Um, in the in the language of love and and uh, uh, there there used to be an expression. Uh, remember, I I remember when you could stop a truck, which is a weird compliment to give, but it used to be kind of commonplace. Or what was the song by? Was it the Commodores? Uh, She's built like a brick house. Well, that's that's a strange compliment too, um, but in there in the culture in the moment it makes perfect sense. And it's when when you're given a compliment like that, you feel good. And he wants to compliment her. And and and, and here um, he says, "Darling," he says, "Raayati," uh, um, or or "Rayati." Actually, uh, it it's translated "darling" here, but "girlfriend" would maybe be a closer way of translating it. We don't usually use that in as a as an endearment. Um, uh, you know, girlfriend, we, we would say honey or sweetheart or something like that. But this is his usual pet name for her throughout the book. It's, and you know, in the, the idea of dearments and nicknames bind us more closely, uh, just as when God gives those nicknames, remember the Jesus renamed Simon and called him Peter, you're the rock. And, and, uh, and he, uh, James and John, he, he called them the Boanerges, the Sons of Thunder, the Motorcycle Disciples. He, he, Jesus renamed some of his disciples, and uh, and as 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 God will sometimes use our friends to give us a, a nickname, um, and and maybe that pleases us. And if it's among our spiritual friends, that can be a, a good thing too. But we know that God loves us and cherishes us. The way we show that when we give each other little pet names and where we call each other things that are dear to us, but they're kind of just done in secret. Verse 10. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. This is still the husband speaking, and there have been those who have seen the word we in verse 11 as a uh, it's as an identity for the Trinity, actually. But jewels, gifts, are are um, decorations. Things are are not what makes a woman lovely or or beautiful. A man's wedding band doesn't make him more handsome, but they are things that are tokens of appreciation. An ornament is a, is appropriate. Such things were once actually used as insurance. If you think about Isaac giving Rebecca uh, jewelry, uh, uh, bangles and rings and things. They were a pledge of, of 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 love and the promise of marriage, but also something she could use to trade for money after he died if she needed it. Um, so it was a, kind of a way of, of of doing insurance. Spiritually, God gives us many gifts and blessings, but what He truly loves in us is not those other gifts, but faith. Um, Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Verse 12, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. Well, the king is, I, I, I think here, her husband. It's not King Solomon. It's her nickname for him. And when we are together, we are a fragrance to each other that it's special to us and makes us enhance one another our love grows when we're together you're the best version of you when i'm with you and i'm certainly the best version of me when when you're with me and spiritually the perfume of the church is here probably a way of talking about our good works they they aren't the the best thing possible but it's what we have to offer to god but the table, the dining couch here um, that he's reclining on, is uh, that's been applied as the means of grace or as the gracious presence of God. Um, and she talks about her perfume, her myrrh, really, um, as a reference to Christ's passion. Um, 
anointed at his burial with it. And Nicodemus brought 25 pounds uh, to his burial, John 19, 39. Well, verse 13, my lover is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. Uh, a sachet is, uh, uh, that's how my wife taught me to say it, is a bag of uh, perfumed things, uh, nice smelling things. It could be flower petals or, or, or something entirely different. Here it's myrrh. Again, a reference perhaps to the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, but always next to her heart. She always has him in her heart. And, and spiritually, we always carry the word of God in our, in our hearts and our minds. We remember and recite our confirmation verse and our catechism every day or, or part of our catechism every single day, doing the creed one day and the Ten Commandments one day and remembering baptism one day and the Lord's Supper and so forth. Luther had a different take on this verse entirely, just thinking in kind of a medieval way, um, in a culture that 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 saw animals feeding and saw women nursing, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more publicly and had a little bit different take on this kind of a verse, where breasts were simply seen as as how to give nourishment and milk to those who needed it, to little children. And, and, and Luther comments, one must always preach Christ, that is, remain between the breasts. Otherwise, the preaching is useless. If you get away from the sweet, nourishing grace of God, the, the milk of the gospel, if you wander off from that, then your preaching is going to be useless. A fascinating take on a verse that otherwise uh, probably makes a lot of readers uncomfortable. Verse 14. My lover is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of, of Engedi. Actually, I think it's pronounced Eingedi. Um, henna blossoms, common in the, in, the, in, the, in the region, for their known for their odor, also for making orange dye. Um, uh, uh, Eingedi is a beautiful getaway by the Dead Sea. It's a way of talking about vacation time. We want to spend time together. And flowers, remember, are in an important way of reminders of various emotions like I love you or I'm sorry or uh, welcome home or hey we're having a baby and or some other emotion and spiritually we find ways to remember and memorialize God's word uh, finding a, a, a different ways to remember passages of the Bible is a God-pleasing thing like using pictures or your fingers or or acronyms like when I teach my catechism class to remember uh, 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 is it Timothy 3.16, uh, God's word is useful for, uh, the word of God is, 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 is for teaching, rebuking, uh, 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 correcting, and training in righteousness. I teach them the word tractor, T-R-C-T-R, -T -R. without the vowels, T-R-C is teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. If you can remember a little word help to help you with the passage, that's a good, fine thing, like having flowers around the house or, or getting away together. 15. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful your eyes are doves. Well, what does this one mean? Doves have quick fluttering moments like batting eyelashes or um, iridescence, I suppose. Or um, spiritually, is it just the Holy Spirit? You have the Spirit in you. Um, or there is peace and domestic security in your eyes. When I look into your eyes, I think that I'm home. This is where we have peace together. Spiritually, the Lord sees what in us? He sees the Holy Spirit, his own gift to us. And that's what he sees. This is where I dwell in my people. Well, in verse 16, she says, how handsome you are, my lover. Oh, how charming. And our bed is verdant. Um, this is the only time the man is called beautiful. It's translated handsome here. Um, but God rarely, or rather man, rarely sees God's glory. But when we remember to talk about it, we, we use amazing words. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's transcendent. It's, it's glorious and so forth. And the, our, our bed is fresh or verdant. That you know the marriage bed is that's where we'd rather be and and when we think about our relationship with God, heaven, his resting place, the place where we're going to be eventually is 
where we want to be forever and ever and, and never get out. And we want to be. It's, it's heaven is my best home. Last verse of our chapter. The, the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters, our firs. You know, what, whatever our house is like, it's a palace to me. Uh, whether it's an apartment or a bungalow or whether it's the little blue, blue rambler on Jefferson Street, this is our palace together. And spiritually, the, this is a picture of the church. It's the earthly temple of God. It's, 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 it's heaven for us. The cedar of the, of the verse reminds us of the cedar in the tabernacle in the Old Testament, or even that the scriptures uh, could be this, since that's where we meet God and spend time with God in, in our Bible. Whether you have an old beaten up paperback or, a, or an old weathered worn copy, or whether yours is new, or maybe the spine is broken, maybe your Bible has got to have tape on the, on the, on the back and to, just to hold it together. But that's the place where you go, your most treasured place, that time every day. When you and I spend time in the word of God, in the presence of God, with his kisses, his gospel, and his affection there in the text. That's chapter one. Thank you for spending time with us and joining us. Uh, join us next time for the remaining chapters, or the beginning of the remaining chapters. And one more thing. I know we're kind of going along today, but um, one of my favorite radio shows is called Car Talk. And one of the fun things about Car Talk is that they had a puzzler every week. And I, I'd like to, to attempt, and maybe, won't, maybe this won't go very far, but I'd like to attempt giving a kind of a little puzzler or quiz at the end of every pair of episodes. And I'll, I'll give the answer at the beginning uh, uh, ne the next time, and we'll kind of continue that way. But um, let, let, let's start with something fairly simple. And if you think about uh, the, the, the author of the Bible, of course, the Holy Spirit ins inspired the whole thing. But uh, I'd like you to think in, 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 in your mind, how many authors are there of the New Testament? And just the, the names of the, of the men who wrote down the text of the New Testament. And what's the number and, and, and who are they? And uh, we'll see if you can if you can uh, come up with that. That's a fairly simple answer. It's not really a puzzle. It's just a trivia question. And maybe that's what we should call this is just uh, Bible trivia or Bible basics. But we'll talk about that when we meet then next time. Till then, God bless you.